Well, this past Monday, I heard a news story of a Cleveland police officer who was on duty and was called to a burglary. And when he arrived, he, he was able to apprehend the burglar. And a scuffle ensued. And there were three shots fired into the Cleveland police officer. But he had a bulletproof vest on. And so while he was bruised, he was relatively unharmed, comparatively unharmed. You see, that morning, that police officer made a decision to put on something that was stronger than just himself. He made a decision to not trust in his flesh, but rather trust in something much stronger. He put on a bulletproof vest and he survived. He survived because he put it on. Well, I want to welcome you back to our series called The Believer's Battle. And we've been here studying the armor of God that we can put on to protect us against the enemy of our souls. Now, do you remember who the enemy is? Is it Obama? Is it Osama? Is it your mama? Is it your husband? Is it your wife? Is it your teacher students? We have a spiritual enemy, that it, we might come back to the students a little later on. We have a spiritual enemy that we have to realize and see as the enemy. Our enemy is not of flesh and blood. We have an enemy known as the devil. We learned our battle is not of flesh and blood, but our real enemy is spiritual. So we fight with spiritual weapons and spiritual armor. Last week, we learned about the what? See, I knew that helmet would mess you up. When I used the helmet as a visual aid, I knew that would mess you up. But we didn't talk about helmet. In fact, we talked about three different ones of these. Thank you. The belt of truth. And I hope, I hope that you are surrounding yourself, that you are holding yourself together with the belt of truth that we talked about last week. Now, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to have you momentarily turn to our root text, which is in Ephesians chapter 6. And I'm just going to read you 14, because uh, you were a little slow on the draw for last week. So I'm going to give you last week's text and this week's root text. Uh, we are in Ephesians chapter 6, uh, verse 14, but we're not going to stay there real long, but here it comes. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist and the breastplate of righteousness in place. On your outline, you'll see a textual target right underneath the bulletproof sermon title in the text. The textual target, righteousness. It won't work if you don't put it on. Righteousness. It won't work if you don't put it on. Now, on the cover, uh, Rhonda gave us a visual of the scriptural breastplate. It's what protects your heart, and it's righteousness. Now, Webster's defines it as being ruled by what is right. Righteousness is being ruled by what is right. In my student Bible, in fact, in your student Bibles that are on the edges of the pews, you'll find a definition of righteousness as being free from sin. Now, I have always been very uneasy with the term righteous and the term righteousness. And I think it's because... What, what's, what's the term we usually think of associated with righteousness? Anybody? Anger. 
self-righteousness. I heard you whisper. Because in my mind, I always thought, I am not righteous. I am not free of sin. I am forgiven of sin. I am regulated by the right. But I am not righteous. What do I do with this righteousness that needs to be in place on me? Well, I love it. I love it when the Bible answers the questions that it asks. We need to have righteousness in place. Well, what righteousness are we talking about? Well, uh, now I know I know you know Mark can lead uh, some good songs, but he also led an excellent Sunday school lesson a little while ago on the book of Romans. And so Romans has a lot to say to us about righteousness. So I would invite you now to move from Ephesians on over to the book of Romans. That's a uh, way in front of your New Testament, sort of. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts of the Apostles. Romans is right there. And our first text that we're going to dig into is Romans chapter 1. And then verses 16 and 17. Do you know what I just realized? I forgot to do Memorize with Christ. We are going to do that after the sermon. And I apologize for that undue stress I caused to the person who is courageously waiting. Some things slipped my mind, and that was one of them. But we will get that done. I'm sorry. Is there anything else that I forgot recently? <laughs> I mean, okay, we'll proceed. Uh, please follow along. We're in Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. In your student Bible, this is known as Luther's Gateway. Luther read this, and the light came on for him spiritually. Let's see if your light comes on. I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. We find a righteousness revealed. We find a righteousness revealed in this text. Look at verse 17. Look at verse 17 very closely. In what is righteousness found? Can you tell me? In what is righteousness found? In the gospel. It's not in the Old Testament. It's not in Roman law. It didn't just come out of Paul's mind. No, the gospel, the good news. What is the gospel? So often we get confused and we forget. What is the gospel? The gospel is Jesus as God came in the flesh, lived a perfect life. In other words, lived a righteous life, died an atoning death, to pay for my sins and for yours, and then rose to life on the third day and lives on today in heaven and with His Holy Spirit inside of us. That's the gospel. That's the good news. Who revealed it? If you look at verse 17, who revealed it? God Himself revealed it. So how do you get it? How do you put this in place? How do we get this righteousness? There's so much confusion. Do we get it by being good? Do we get it by giving money? Do we get it by reading your Bible and memorizing verses? No, if we look closely at the verses, actually you don't have to look real close. It says it plain. By faith, we get this righteousness. Stick with me. In verse 17. By faith in what? Or in who? Later. In just a little bit, we're going to look at what not to put faith in. Who not to put faith in, but first. 
do you, do you actually believe the gospel? Yes. Do you believe that it's true? <coughs> do you believe that it was revealed by God Himself? Do you believe salvation is really open to anyone who believes? Yes. Even you? Do you really believe that? To summarize, friends, this morning there is a bulletproof vest available for you. There is one available. Let's read on. I'm going to have you turn the page in your Bible. Some of you won't even have to get to chapter 3. Verses 9 through 20. Verses 9 through 20. And here again we're going to talk about who we shouldn't trust in. Who we shouldn't have faith in. Who does not have righteousness. What shall we conclude then? Are we any better? Not at all. We have already made the charge that the Jews and the Gentiles alike are all under sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves, their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. In the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know whatever the law says. It says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced, and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. Righteousness removed is what we find. Righteousness removed. Now this is about as counterculture as we can get in this age of I'm okay, you're okay, we're all essentially good people. Paul quotes some of the nastiest descriptions of people in the psalm to prove a simple point that I'm not righteous. You're not righteous. Nobody is righteous. My flesh is not strong enough to keep the devil's bullets from penetrating my heart because we're all sinners in need of a Savior. Who doesn't know a politician or a preacher, a general or a teacher who hasn't done good things, hasn't been righteous, and then fell? And then got shot through with sin. And we realize, oh my goodness, look at that. Maybe they're not all that righteous after all. Truth is, they weren't righteous to begin with. But we don't have to look at the famous. Ask the average person. Just ask the average person. Do you think you're, you're a good person? Most people would say, mm -hmm based on the majority of their behavior. But God's law gives us a different perspective, doesn't it? As that same average person who says they're essentially a good person, simply say to them, have you ever uh, envied anyone? Have you ever told a lie? Have you ever taken something that's not yours? Well, God's law gives us a different perspective, doesn't it? God's law would say, actually, you're an envious, lying thief. Okay? If at very best, my breastplate of righteousness is paper thin and has holes in it, what am I supposed to do? Where am I supposed to get this breastplate that I'm supposed to put in place? Well, to summarize, you need to understand that your bulletproof vest is full of holes. 
but there is a bulletproof vest available to you. And that's what we're going to get to right now. We're going to continue on in verses 21 through 26. But now righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference. For all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by the, His grace through the redemption that came by Jesus, by Christ Jesus. God presented Him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in His blood. He did this to demonstrate His justice. Because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time, so as to be just. And the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Whose righteousness are you trusting in this morning? If you try to justify yourself to God by all the good you do, in other words, salvation by the works, the devil will get you in one of two attacks. If you are sitting here this morning and you, you believe that you are justified, that you are saved by what you do, the devil is going to get you in one of two attacks. The first is the attack of pride. You'll do good things. I'm sorry, let me give you that feeling. Did I give you the feeling righteous redeemed? They gave it to you up top. Or did I give it to you? No. I'm being very forgiving. So we don't wonder if you get out of here with a better ditch. Alright, let's track back. Pride. I have no pride this morning. I left it all behind. The good things you do. You do good things, people won't notice. They will thank you. They will praise others about you. You will feel right. And you believe that you are right. And if you aren't careful, you will forget that you are a sinner saved by grace. And the good stuff you do, indeed you should. But it doesn't save you. The other way that they'll get you with your acts of righteousness is with pity. Okay, you'll do good things. You'll do all your good things. And you know what? Nobody will notice. And nobody will thank you. And no one will tell all the, all the people the good things that you do. And you'll sit there and you'll go, oh man, God don't even care that I do good things. Maybe I can't do nothing good enough, right enough. I don't even know if I'm saved. Because nobody cares. And you forget. You forget that outside of your pity, you're just a sinner saved by grace. It's not your righteousness that saves you. It's the righteousness of Christ that you take on when you have faith in Him. Listen to verses 22 and 25. You can even close your eyes and just listen to them. Let them wash over you. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. Jesus' blood, I know it's, it's a strange metaphor to mix, but Jesus' blood makes you bulletproof. When you put your faith in him, you receive his righteousness, your pride and pity go out the window. Because now your relationship with God is what matters. It isn't about what you do, but rather what Jesus did. One of my favorite sign sayings is religion is due. Christianity is done. What does a breastplate or a bulletproof vest protect? Protects your heart. In your heart, how protected do you feel today? In your heart, 
How secure do you feel about the righteousness that you have put in place? Is it time to get the best that works when you put it on? Trust Jesus today. Let us pray. Oh Lord, I thank you that when we have faith in you, you look beyond us. You look beyond our mess. You look beyond our sin and you see the righteousness of Christ. Lord, the blood that was spilled was spilled for me and for all who sit here. And Lord, for some who sit here and are trusting in their own righteousness, Lord, I pray that they would take yours on before they realize the futility of their own. Lord, for those who are struggling with the pride today of their own righteousness, would you humble them? For those who are struggling with pity, feeling like they could never be right, would you remind them that your righteousness is available and it's all that they need? Lord Jesus, thank you for your word and your witness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.